that I uh, hope we can discuss later. Um, and, and that is the fact that so many um, municipal and government employees get forced into Medicare Advantage programs. That's the case. My my mother, who's 97, is a retired school teacher in Illinois. She's actually been retired more years than she taught. Um, uh, but she was forced into a Medicare Advantage program by her state, uh, state pension fund. Um, and I would like to throw out the idea of uh, trying to get legislation that made a requirement that municipal and government, that employees of any kind um, being offered uh, Medicare plans by their union or town or whatever, be offered the option of straight Medicare or traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage. If they still want to choose Medicare Advantage, it's their choice. But I think that anybody and everybody um, should be allowed to choose straight Medicare. Um, so th that's just an idea to talk about later on. And maybe, maybe that's, maybe there are already, uh, there's already been discussions about that. I don't know. I don't think there have been, and I do appreciate it because people who have been at uh, previous meetings know that I rant about this. Uh, my husband is a state of Connecticut a retiree. He worked mm -hmm. for the state for 11 years back in the like 1980s. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he first retired for the first year or two, they he was told sign up for you know, med standard Medicare A and B and the state will provide the gap. And about four years ago, all the state retirees were switched to Medicare Advantage plans. First, it was universal health care. I think now it changed to Aetna, but it might have changed, or maybe it changed to Cigna. And now it's, I don't know, they keep changing their provider. And uh, it's right. been explained to me that it's, they do, the state does better because the federal reimbursement rates are higher. But in the long term, it gives, among other things, it gives the insurance companies uh, too much power to have so many more people in their pool. Yeah. Even though I think at an individual level, the state covers the gap, whatever, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it's still a, a problem. So um, I, I think we should, since we're showing the shorter film and we have about 15 minutes of shorts afterwards, uh, fix it more about uh, the for-profit healthcare system in general and the shorter uh, clips about uh, the disadvantages of, of, of advantage plans. And I think we'll still have some time at the end to, to do some discussing about paths forward. So I'm going to share my screen and I hope it works. I've done this before once. Oh. So let's see if oh, that's weird. I don't know why the YouTube is showing, but let me see if I can make this full screen. And start it up. And let me know if you don't hear, it should be okay though. Over this period of 35 years, the company grew from zero to 170 million in sales and became the leading company in both the picture frame industry and mirrors. From 1980 into the 90s, uh, we were doubling our size every two and a half to three years. 
as a result of foreign competition, our gross profit margins deteriorated. We had to watch every penny of overhead. So here we are, we're mobilizing our resources very carefully, we're controlling costs. And the one area that was so confounding was healthcare costs. We would be faced with double digit, sometimes high double digit increases. The premiums in total for healthcare costs has actually doubled over the last 10 years. That's an exorbitant increase. That's more than any other expense has increased over that same 10 year period. After years and years of incurring these significant cost increases, I started to look into healthcare. The one great thing about MCS is if there is a problem, we deal with it straight ahead. We investigate, we resolve, we fix. For an average family of four, this year's number is $23,000. That's what a typical American family insured that way costs. And they have this false sense of security that they're in a, a plan that provides them protection. But uh, regrettably, all too often, people find out when it's too late, after they've been sick, after they've been hospitalized or, or injured and, and requiring expensive treatment, that their coverage was not nearly what they thought it was and insurance companies are able to charge older people uh, three times as much as younger people for the exact same policy. Their potential employer sees them as a risk. The age 50 to 64 age bracket includes very high rates of uninsurance within the U.S. market, and it's because these are very expensive employees. It makes it less likely that uh, employers will even consider hiring someone in their 50s, for example, or early 60s. I've talked to people who's, who's told me they've not gotten a raise in five years because the money they would otherwise have gotten uh, in raises has gone to insurance companies. We've created a very fragmented system in which coverage is tied to employment in ways it isn't in most other countries in the world. If you and your family lose their whole health insurance because of a change in your employment status, that's an incredible insecurity, an incredible burden for families to have to bear. So the whole idea of, of having insurance that protects us from financial ruin, it just doesn't exist anymore for most people. And this is why of a million bankruptcies in the United States, over 60% are associated with medical conditions. And the great majority of those are people who have health insurance. We went through years of working hard only to lose everything lose our home, go bankrupt. What a shameful thing to do to people. You see these numbers of people who don't have insurance and families who are driven to bankruptcy. If you talk to most families, they can identify at least one person in their family who has really struggled with health care issues and how to finance those issues. 40,000 unnecessary deaths every year because there's no health insurance. And these are real people who are suffering and who are dying. Insurance, but I never actually thought a whole lot about it. I paid the premiums. I wasn't using anything that much. My out-of-pocket expenses were pretty much nil. But then Bill got sick, and he was hospitalized. So all of a sudden, these bills started rolling in, and my insurance wasn't covering everything. In 2014, a family that was paying four to 5,000 as a premium share, and MCS was paying 13 to 14,000 as their share of the coverage, that family could pay another six or $12,000 if one or two people got sick. We're up around $10,000 in expenses. What would happen if I would get sick? Our expenses would be probably up around $16,000 a year. 
that's unbelievable. If anything happens to me, that's, we're, we're done. The current costs of the system are becoming intolerable. And as they become intolerable, their business naturally is going to look for other solutions. It distracts businesses from doing their primary function, precludes them being able to budget for hiring, for investment, for expanding their enterprise. Why are we creating an extra hurdle for business? It's tough enough out there. You know, why are we making it harder for people to provide goods and services to the American public while employing people and providing tax revenues. I often ask folks that I work with who own businesses, tell me one thing in your business that you spend, the kind of money you spend on health insurance that adds no value to your business. There's a middleman, an insurance company, that isn't improving your employees' health, that isn't saving you money, and that is not doing what's best in the best interest of our economy. Healthcare costs are going up two to two and a half percent above the projected growth of gross domestic product. So it is running away from us. Healthcare costs have gone up to three trillion dollars. We've gone from seven percent of the economy back in 1971 being healthcare to 18 percent today. When the rest of the world is spending less than 10 percent of their economies and getting healthcare to all of their citizens. I remember 35 years ago when health care was affordable. MCS had great insurance, full coverage with minimal deductibles. U.S. employers across the country provided well for their employees. No worries. That's all been eroded by a relentless increase in health care costs. Today, there's a dark cloud of anxiety in the country a dark cloud over our employees. They're one diagnosis, one accident away from financial disaster. A few sick employees can take down a company. The dark cloud hangs over our cities. No money for infrastructure, no money for schools, high taxes. That dark cloud hangs over our whole economy, causing flat wages and no money to spend to fuel real growth. It's a problem that we have to solve. Well, Medicare can take care of the uh, sickest and the oldest in our society, and they can do it actually at far less cost uh, than the private insurance companies could do. They don't have the same kind of cost that the, that the private insurance companies have. They don't spend enormous amounts of money on their sales and marketing teams and on advertising and they don't need to have an infrastructure in which uh, they're, they're going back and forth with healthcare providers on a daily basis to try to determine whether or not something is a covered benefit, which is also something that eats up uh, an enormous amount of their premium revenue. It's the system as a whole that creates the inefficiency. The fact that there are so many different payers and so many different plans and so many different ways in which bills have to be made and collected so having multiple insurances and having multiple ways of even billing for that patient is adding to the inefficiencies of the patients. You look at quality and variability, they're opposite of one another. The more variability that you have, the more entities, provider, payer, insurance, manufacturers, and, and so on, the more chances of error, the more inefficiencies, the more cost. One of the reasons why hospital bills are so high, why we are charged so much by doctors, is because they have to spend uh, a lot of resources. They have to hire staff who do nothing more than engage in a nitpicking war with insurance companies on a daily basis to make sure that they are getting paid appropriately. It makes me angry to see so much waste in health care, that there are nurses who are pulled away from actually providing hands-on patient care, and they're pulled into administrative duties. And they're pulled into those duties because we have an incredibly complex billing system. We have many different payers in our billing system. We have people who can't pay, people who have this insurance, people who have that insurance. So there's nurses whose full-time job is to help get authorization so that a patient can get the care they need. And that's ridiculous. I would really love to be a nurse without having to think about whether or not 
a patient can get the care they need. Whether or not a patient is sent home from the hospital without the proper medications because they can't afford it. Whether or not a patient is going to be able to get a treatment that a doctor recommends because their insurance company won't pay for it and they can't afford it. And it does break your heart. Uh, we as a small practice of five doctors and one provider uh, deal with about 20 different insurance companies at this point. We have a middle office that has three people in it and an office manager that deal with essentially insurance issues and payment issues all the time. If I write a prescription and they want more information, my nurse has to call up that company, wait for their telephone system to come up with a live voice, give them the particulars of the patient and the medication, but it's not uncommon that they spend 30 minutes with one appeal. So we're trying to figure out the game so that we spend the least amount of time doing that kind of baloney. Every physician spends $84,000 a year just to interact with the private health insurance industry. So insurance companies increasingly are the force in the room, unseen but powerful. When you're in the hospital room, that's who is really driving a lot of the decisions that are made. How long you're gonna be in the hospital, what drugs you're gonna be given, what access to providers or tests that you have, those things are increasingly driven by the insurance company reimbursement. MCS pays one and a half million dollars a year for its health insurance. And where does it go? Three cents of every dollar goes to an insurance agent that represents MCS in selecting an insurance plan and negotiating price. The next 20 cents of our premium dollar goes to the insurance company for its sales and marketing expense and for its staff to pre-approve and deny care and its administrative expense. And then you have at the provider level, 10 to 15 cents that goes to hospitals and doctors to interface with my insurance company. They face massive amounts of paperwork and phone time dealing with pre-approvals and denials and payment issues. None of it is related to care. That's 33 cents of our dollar before the actual cost of care is paid for. My insurance company is supposed to negotiate better prices from the providers, but on average, they end up paying 20% more than Medicare does. They pass that extra cost on to my company. I don't see what private insurance brings to the table. What keeps insurance company CEOs up at night is the, the worry that other CEOs that, that will eventually come to realize that they, they add more cost than value to our healthcare system. And that more and more uh, employers, corporate executives are beginning to, to understand that. When you have a publicly accountable system, as we could have a single payer, you can have less confusion. Over and over again, we're hearing the same plea. The system is too confusing. We need to have simplification to control cost and to improve quality. And what about single payer health insurance? What does it mean? One entity that pays the bills. We get rid of the hundreds of complicated insurance plans and we have one comprehensive plan that covers everybody. It's simple and efficient. You go to any doctor or any hospital you want present a card, and you're covered. There are no deductibles, no out-of-pocket expenses, and no contentious pre-approval before treatment. Everybody is covered. Nobody is left out. Single payer is not a government takeover of health care. The doctors and hospitals remain totally independent, just like they are with Medicare. If I told you that every one of your employees could get the health care they need guaranteed, that your costs would go down, everyone would pay less and get more, you might be skeptical. But the truth is, most every country in the world does that.
The benefits in Taiwan's single-payer system are comprehensive. You have inpatient care, hospitalizations, uh, visits to doctors, drugs, dental care, free uh, child delivery, dialysis, all of that is paid for. Patients have complete freedom of choice of providers. Taiwan spends 1.6% of its total operating budget on administration. And that is a tiny fraction of what we spend in this country. It's the peace of mind that it gives people, which Americans don't have yet. I hope every American has that someday. The data shows very compelling information about single-payer systems. And so it was imperative that we visit a single-payer system and experience what life was like on the ground. Fortunately, we've got a single-payer system operating to our north in Canada. I found that I was really quite unencumbered when it came to seeing the patients, that I could concentrate on doing medicine and not worry about other things. And that was quite a change from what my experience had been. I worked in community health centers in Oakland, California for many years. I was the medical director there and the medical director also of a consortium of community health centers also in the East Bay area. I left there in 2004 and moved to Canada. Sometimes when I'm driving around here, I think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm back in a Marcus Welby episode or something. First family practice department meeting that I attended here in Canada was quite an experience. People actually seemed happy. No one was talking about the latest outrage that had occurred from some insurance company. No one was complaining that they couldn't see their patients anymore. As a Canadian physician, I sort of laugh when I hear people talk about government, you know, telling me what to do or government-run health care. That's certainly not been my experience uh, of working in the Canadian health care system. I, I have a, an enormous degree of clinical autonomy. People seem to think that because there's a single payer that you are working for the government. Okay. You're an employee. They tell you what to do. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let's see how blood pressure's doing today. I'm in practice. I'm a small business person. They're not running my business for me. They don't come in and review me and tell me, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. They're the ones that pay me for the work that I do. This is what I do to bill for one patient. I bring up the patient, click on you, type in the code, a uh, billing item and a diagnosis code. The date is already filled in for me. I create bill and it's done. It is very simple. You know, basically you come in, I see you, I send off a bill. Two weeks later, there's money in the bank. Patient doesn't have to pay. We are billing on behalf of University Health Network for four hospitals for diagnostic tests to the Ministry of Health. We don't see any situations where the ministry is second guessing the doctor's clinical decision on the test. We bill weekly, electronically, and there are approximately 10,000 claims on those weekly billings. And those are handled by approximately 10 people within the department. This uh, myth about Canadians dying on waiting list is simply that, it's a myth. When people have something really urgent that needs to be dealt with uh, in the Canadian healthcare system, it, it gets dealt with. The notion that having a single payer somehow causes wait times is not actually borne out by the international evidence on healthcare system design. We see healthcare systems internationally where it's a single payer system and there's virtually no wait time at all, Taiwan being a good example of that. We see systems that have multi-payers uh, where wait times have been a big problem. There's a lot of mythology out there that somehow there's a big tax burden or a big cost that comes along with the Canadian publicly funded model. In my 25 years as a cross-border tax consultant, I'd say I've prepared at least 5,000 U.S. returns and about the same amount, 5,000 Canadian returns. The surprising thing is that even though on an income of $50,000, the tax rates in Canada and the U.S. are about the same, 
In Canada, that tax covers primary health care. In the U.S., there'd be additional cost to that person, either through their own insurance or employer insurance. Canada now spends half as much per person as we do in the United States, yet their life expectancy has increased faster than ours. I am Dan Konkin, and I'm the president of Amco Manufacturers. We're a family-owned business, and been in business for over 47 years. I'm a member of the Conservative Party of Canada, and we stand for removing waste, being more efficient, and finding ways to grow our own businesses. And one of the greatest ways that we can grow our business is to reduce cost. And that's why we embrace the Canadian healthcare system. What I don't understand is why my fellow Conservatives in the United States tend to fight this. So my name is Terry Alexander and I work for Amco Manufacturers and I've been an employee here for 17 years. From what I've experienced, the Canadian healthcare system is amazing. I've, I felt very well taken care of. I didn't feel like there was any treatment that was available that they weren't providing for me. Um, my appointments were very quick. While I was going through my treatment of my surgery and the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy, it was absolutely exhausting and very stressful and lots of anxiety. If I had had the added burden of coming up with thousands of dollars for my health care coverage to fight this disease, it would have been devastating. It would have been horrible. When I hear that people say our Canadian system isn't good, it, it makes me a bit angry because I'm quite proud of our Canadian system. There are obviously far, far, far more stories in the U.S. about people who are not being able to get the care that they need than you'll ever find in Canada. Canadian hospitals and Canadian doctors have more bed days per thousand and more visits per capita than in the United States. We looked at opening up a U.S. operation. We wanted to be closer to our customer base. We wanted to be closer to our supply base. But the more we looked at it, the amount of cost that we would have incurred by having our company relocate into the United States just through the insurance coverage costs alone just made it a non-starter. If I had to increase my cost by over a million dollars in my company because of insurance coverage costs, that alone would probably drive me to bankruptcy. As a business owner and, and also as a former uh, Republican legislator, I've said that conservatives should be supportive of single payer because it costs less. Talking with corporate executives, a lot of them, I think, get this. They know what waste is. They wouldn't be running successful companies if they tolerated waste in their production system and they can see the waste on the healthcare side. This crazy transactional system is costing them money without value. Business, when they look at the single payer model, will come quickly to the conclusion that it is the least expensive the most supportive of a free market and will have the most direct effect on their costs of operation. The cost to my company and its employees goes down with single payer. Instead of high insurance premiums with high deductibles, there's a simple payroll fee like we pay for Social Security. My company gets out of the healthcare business. Single payer makes economic sense. We save $198 billion by eliminating insurance administrative cost and profits. We save $242 billion by reducing the administrative cost to doctors and hospitals that no longer waste time and staff interacting with multiple insurance companies. We save $116 billion by establishing a fair, standardized fee schedule for hospitals and providers of care. We save $154 billion by negotiating bulk pricing on medical devices and drugs, like all other advanced industrialized countries. The total savings is $710 billion a year. The $710 billion in savings means we can lower the overall cost of health care. We can afford $77 billion to cover the uninsured and afford $129 billion to eliminate out-of-pocket expenses. It's about shifting resources from wasteful spending to actual care. You know, the great irony of all this is when somebody says, oh, can we afford single payer? Is we can't afford the current system. The only thing we can afford is single payer because single payer is the only way that we can bring costs 
under control and bring the rate of growth in health care costs to a rate sustainable over the long term. Just imagine what it would mean for this country if we could cut our health care bill by 25 percent. Imagine what it would mean for our infrastructure, for disposable income, for our overall economic vitality. Imagine what it would mean for our business community not to have this albatross around their neck. It would be extraordinary. So is that convincing enough? We should do an experiment where we have a group of people watch that and do their blood pressure before and afterwards. It's... Yeah. <laughs> I'm constantly running into people who, you know, say, well, you have to be careful about the Canadian system because they're really having a lot of problems and people wait forever and blah, 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 blah. blah. And that seems to have been who pooed in the film. I think the film is like eight, about eight years old, something they said 2015. So I don't know if something has changed in the last couple of years, but I mean, it was pretty convincing from what I could see. Well, they are having big problems in Canada, but um, part of that's because it's a national system, but it's administered by the individual provinces. And in some places it's... Mm -hmm worse off than others, but it really has to do with staffing and uh, things like that. Um, it, it's it's still a much better system than what we have. To note too that <clears throat> people wait a long time here. I mean, I know a bunch of people, people in my personal life, clients who have had to wait, you know, months to get like a tooth pulled you know, or, or something else. Um, so people are waiting a long time here. Um, and I, and I think it's one of the things I appreciated about the film was it really makes like the conservative case for single payer. Um, and one of the things that I heard, so, you know, a little different, but when, um, you know, we passed the resolution in, in Wyndham for Medicare for all, um, you know, they said almost everybody on the town council voted for it. And, and their reasoning was like, as a as Willimantic's not a rich town, um, it would save us so much money, you mm. know, to not have to pay, you know, the health care costs of, you know, all of the municipal employees. So I think that that's a really, really strong case to, to be made. And that's one that I, you know, when I have conversations with people, I try to bring that up a lot. Yeah, that's when in Hamden it was a similar thing because we, you know, we've got one of the highest tax rates in the entire state, which says a lot in Connecticut. Um, and one of the one of the reasons um, is healthcare costs for employees just keep going up. Um, mm -hmm. And just with regards to wait times, Matt, I this year had to wait almost six months for a routine physical. But mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the the Kaiser Family Foundation um, published a study. Um, this month um, about small business um, health insurance for employees of small businesses and uh, average income for small business employees is 44000 a year. Um, and the average family, um, the, the least expensive family plan that they could find in this study um, was about $9,000 a year. Uh, and that's with large deductibles. Mm -hmm. And most of the plans were $12,000 and up. Um, they found that 35% uh, of all of the people, um, all the families insured, um, all of the small business employees, families insured, um, had $5,000 deductibles. Um, and 57% uh, had $3,000 deductibles. Um, and when you're raising a family on $44,000 a year, 
you absolutely don't have even three thousand dollars. I mean, you all know the the statistic about um, you know the average person in this country doesn't have uh, five hundred dollars for an emergency. Uh, mm -hmm. Like half the population is is in that, and so five thousand dollars it's just unrealistic, and it's killing small business, mm -hmm. uh, and it's literally killing their employees, literally. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I, I worked for a small business, a small child care center for about four years and covered insurance for me and my husband. And it was really expensive. Um, but CBIA always seems to be opposed to any kind of single payer. How does that make sense? I think it's because they're ideologues. Oh. They're they're speaking from a standpoint of ideology, um, you know. Oh, socialism, you know. Mm -hmm. One thing I liked about this film was that it um, it used the term single payer more than Medicare for all. Because um, now that I'm retired and I've had I've had straight Medicare since 2018, um, and I made sure that it was straight Medicare. Um, I find that the premiums are pretty darn high, you know. And, you know, every year you have to check that out. And is there another company that offers a better one for your sub supplementary? And, you know, it's not straightforward at all. Um, so, you know, I like the idea of single payer as opposed to Medicare for all. Everyone seems to want to call it Medicare for all, but that has some drawbacks to me. But anyways, I, I would take it. <laughs> well, in Connecticut, if we had a state system, perhaps a, uh... Husky for all would uh, mm -hmm. would would check the right boxes because Medicaid actually is mm -hmm. a better model in Connecticut than Medicare. It covers more. It's a not for profit system. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be in Connecticut, um, but it's in for many people that's is you no know, a stigma because that's insurance for poor people. I, I think that in Connecticut with the Husky name, we've done a halfway decent job of, of destigmatizing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a lot of people, Medicaid is the section eight of medical care. Um, but also a lot of people, I, I used to work in the hospital and a lot of people, patients and families would say, well, if we had Medicaid, you know, all this would be paid for, but we have we can't get the pay treatment we need because we we don't have Medicaid. But the poor people get it all, you know. I don't, I didn't know if that was true or not, but they have that very clear, you know. I do have friends that have, in service, you know, industry jobs who, you know, reduce their hours. They do a lot of things just so they can, can be covered by Medicaid because, mm -hmm. uh, it's the best and most affordable insurance their family could could get. Mm -hmm. So I think some people do game the system a little bit to get it, but who can blame them really? That's that's not even gaming the system. I, Does... I have personal experience with that. Um, a year ago, <clears throat> my husband lost his job unexpectedly and <clears throat> still lost his insurance and um, um, has been on Medicaid, Kinetic, Kineticares or something like Medicare. that. Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, um for the last year and yeah it's been fabulous i think it covers more stuff and mm -hmm. offers things like a um uh, an online once a week chair yoga class mm -hmm. um, that actually benefit his health too mm -hmm. so does anybody know off the top of their head um how much money um, Walmart is subsidized every year by virtue of the fact that most of its employees are on Medicaid or a large percentage of them. There, mm -hmm. that I've seen the number before, but I can't remember it. But it's a huge amount of money, and they are gaming the system, <laughs> unlike oh, yeah. the oh, individual yeah. families. Yeah, it's, um, it's a huge, it's a huge amount of money. When I worked at United Services in Willimantic. Um, I had a lot of clients who worked at Walmart and they all were on Medicaid, like every single one of them, like yeah. 
none of them make enough money to to get the the health insurance or they don't have enough hours i should say to get the health insurance through through walmart which is right. entirely intentional yeah 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 so we have about 15 minutes left of the regular t meeting time though we could go a little past um i want to show it i i have a couple of of clips um about Medicare Advantage. I think one is about 12 minutes and one is about two minutes. And uh, I just wanna put it out there that if anyone wants to start working for a resolution in your town, we do have the fix it film. We could you know, have meetings in your town and uh, to show, show the movie and to, uh, there were resolutions in New London, in Wyndham, in Hamden, New Haven and Stanford, I believe. So we have people in our group from those areas who have some experience with it. And with that, uh, if it's, I will share the screen and again, since it seemed to work, and um, and watch something about advantage. Mm -hmm. Hey there, Christopher Westfall here. I want to bring you in. Uh, this is quite compelling and insightful. This is uh, Clark Howard, who I've followed for many, many years. Clark Howard had millions of listeners to his nationally syndicated radio pro uh, program, now a podcast, who was helping seniors to navigate financial topics, to avoid getting ripped off, uh, travel deals, tips on how to buy things and really a consumer advocate that never himself advocated or tried to sell one thing. Unlike Dave Ramsey, who tries to pitch his courses and sell them through churches, Clark Howard has never had anything for sale. He's only told the truth. And today I'm bringing you what Clark Howard has had to say recently, which has opened a lot of eyeballs out there about Medicare Advantage. Uh, take a look. Today, I have not one, but two special warnings for you. The first deals with Medicare and something that has been so confusing to people when they are approaching the age of Medicare eligibility, 65. And I also want to talk about an alarming trend in mortgages. Now, this is interesting because Clark Howard himself is 66 years old. So he just went through his initial election period last year, turning 65. And this was kind of an eye opener, especially for a consumer advocate as strongly willed as Clark Howard. And here's his take, and my opinion along with it, about Medicare Advantage as it pertains to the difference between Medicare Advantage versus Medigap or Medicare Supplement. That is the program, Medigap, Medicare Supplement, that 90% of agents that are walking up to you and talking to you about Medicare will Curiously, never bring up. Agents today are trained never to talk about Medicare supplement as an option anymore. They only push Medicare Advantage because the money with Medicare Advantage is more than double when you get somebody new to Medicare. So listen to Clark Howard in his own words, repeat what I've been saying for the last six years. Or you yourself or the person approaching age 65. I want you to have a heads up warning. When you are generally about four months out from turning 65, you will have a blizzard of traditional mail show up. I mean, like in the mailbox from what are known as advantage plans, which are generally a disadvantage plan for you. Traditional Medicare allows you to seek care where you wish for the conditions that you might have. But if you go into a Medicare Advantage plan, as a new federal report finds, repeatedly people are denied care. And now, if you've not yet seen that Medicare Advantage report from the Office of Inspector General at Health and Human Services, I really recommend you watching that video on this YouTube channel. The only one that brought it to you first that talks about the routine denials of care with Medicare Advantage. That's what Clark's talking about. Whether he's a subscriber to my channel or not, I don't know, but that's what he's talking about. It's been absolutely documented now that denial of care is the modus operandi of Advantage. Plans. And it's costing people their lives and their health. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans 
were dreamt up as a way to reduce government spending on health care on the elderly. But it's had a double effect because the big insurance companies that, that push these Medicare Advantage plans so hard <laughs> and the commission salespeople who make a lot of money for getting initial enrollments of people at age yes, 65 do. into these Advantage plans, everybody's pushing you into them because the insurance companies are making a ton on these Advantage plans. And how are they making a ton? From denial of care. That's the whole game. Now, this is Clark Howard giving his opinion, and I'm giving my opinion on Clark Howard, but it's not just opinion. That is a conclusion, which I encourage you to read the entire study, which you can find on my video, from the Inspector General said, the reason why these denials of care are routine is because that is the profit differential. That's what it is. It's profit driven. So that's not just his opinion. That is actually the fact based on the is that, that as somebody gets older, we got more things wrong with us. We spend more time uh, dealing with conditions, chronic and otherwise. And if you can delay, 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 deny as an insurer, you're not spending that money. So you lose the freedom you have with traditional Medicare. We just had this brought up last week. We had a person who was on a Plan G, and because of health conditions, they're getting rate increases and could not move their Plan G Medigap plan, Medicare supplement plan. And they said, well, maybe this year I'll just go to one of the free plans. And that's my concern in this area is as you're getting older, things tend to break down more often, not less often. And as health deteriorates, that's when the, the secrets of Medicare Advantage become available to you. They, they manifest themselves when you see the strength or the weakness of the actual coverage that you have. And that's what the, the sad thing is when people are 65 not knowing they're giving up their one and only opportunity as a golden ticket to get Medicare supplement, any plan, Medicare Advantage, any plan, and they give that up for one opportunity to get on an Advantage plan without knowing you may never be able to get a Medicare supplement plan again. Traditional Medicare is complicated because you have Part A, you have Part B, you have supplements, you have Part D, and you're going to have to pay all these premiums for B, your supplement, and D. And so people are like, hey, this Advantage plan looks great. I don't have to pay any monthly premiums in many cases. And supposedly I'm taken care of every possible way. What could go wrong? Well, the people who should go in an Advantage plan are people who cannot afford to pay the premiums because you're on a tight, 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 tight budget and you have to accept the choice of less choice in your health care and denial of care is part of what you get. And that's who should consider these disadvantaged plans, known as Advantage plans. On the other hand, if you can afford the premiums for Part B and Part D and to buy your Medigap, and you'll be paying money every month for that, and then you have true, comprehensive, real medical coverage as you age through your 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, if you can afford to pay those premiums, go in traditional Medicare. Do not, do not, do not fall for the propaganda of the disadvantaged plans. Remember that word. Every time you see one of those bright, colorful mailers that show up in your mailbox that say advantage, remember to put D-I-S in front of it in your mind so that you don't get swindled by the insurers that don't care about your health don't care about your life and just want your money. Krista, are you ready for the response from the big health insurers to that? I'm not worried. Okay. Yeah, I can tell you what that response is going to be. I was at an industry conference recently and a colleague uh, that is a competitor in the industry pulled me aside and he said, I love what you're doing for seniors. You're helping them, but you're too loud at what you're saying. So what do you mean? He said, you cannot call out the negativity of the industry. 
he literally said you can't have anything negative going out there and it's not negative it's truth there's a difference between being negative all the time which i'm not and being truthful and telling the truth and if there's just one lone voice in the wilderness calling out telling you wait there's more to the story it's not just all a free ride once you sign your name to a free plan and that agent happily walks away skipping down your driveway there's more to the story than that and i don't care if i'm the only one left or just a handful of us left online telling the truth i've only been licensed for 26 years now but i'm getting the hang of it i've seen thousands of stories of how this has decimated people's lives not just the insured but their family who has to yell and advocate and scream and appeal 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 and get denied and then finally pay for things out of their pocket because if something is denied in medicare advantage and your appeals have exhausted themselves the only choice then is for you to pay 100 percent out of your pocket you don't still get the medicare discount on outpatient services being paid for at 80 percent by medicare you are out of that system when you sign up for medicare advantage it's just the truth my agency helps people with Medicare Advantage, Medicare Supplement, and telling the truth so that you have a clear understanding of all the options that are available to you specific to your zip code. That's what my office does and would be happy to do for you or anyone you love that is struggling with their Medicare insurance right now. Please give us a call. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Bye-bye. I, I only just got the message. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I'm hearing some weird things. Hmm. Okay, I'm having a little. We can hear you. Um, yes, yeah, that um, that isn't the right one, though. I think the other one, there is another one about uh, Medicare for all denials. That's two minutes long. If people uh, want to watch that, I can share that one. Hold on for one sec. This, uh, let's see. Medicare Advantage is the managed care option within the Medicare program. It's designed to provide efficient, high-quality care that improves patient health outcomes in a cost-efficient way. But a new report by the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General, found that sometimes Medicare Advantage plans limited access to medically necessary services. To explain this report's findings, here is Rosemary Bartholomew. In this report, we found that Medicare Advantage plans sometimes denied or delayed patients' access to care even though the requests for services were medically necessary and met Medicare coverage rules. So in other words, the patients likely would have received approval if they had been enrolled in traditional Medicare rather than in Medicare Advantage. These report findings are cause for concern for several reasons. We have three main concerns about these denials for care that was medically necessary and that met Medicare coverage rules. First, these denials can cause delays or prevent patients from accessing needed health care. And that can be particularly harmful for patients who are critically ill and for whom any delay in care can cause negative health consequences. Second, these denials can cause some patients to pay out of pocket for services that are supposed to be covered by their Medicare benefits. And this can be particularly harmful for low-income patients and those who can't afford to pay for these services out of pocket. And third, these denials can cause an administrative burden for patients and providers who choose to appeal these denials. And even when denials are overturned upon appeal, 
We found that in some cases, going through the appeals process caused significant delays in patients' access to needed health care. For more information, visit oig.hhs.gov forward slash Medicare Advantage. Oh. Oh. Yeah, this, okay. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, we, it's eight o'clock, but Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about what PNHP is doing to uh, fight the bandage uh, and, and worse on the Medicare scene? Um, sure. Um, I'll just I'll just um, limit it to to one specific thing or, or perhaps two um, but the main thing is um, we are uh, you know our, our goal is is same as your goal um, and that's to have single payer coverage um, for everybody um, I like to call it Medicare for all ages um, there's not to come up with yet another term but but uh, we Medicare works. It's been working for 50 years, uh, more actually, and uh, and it works and it's very efficient. Um, and uh, we just need to expand it to all ages. So our our main, um, or I'll, I'll just speak for myself, but I, I think it's pretty much mainstream with PNHP. Um, my main um, tactic so the strategy is to move to Medicare for for all or single payer for all. Um, I, I think the most important thing to do right now is to do everything possible to fight back uh, Medicare Advantage. And there's actually um, some encouraging things happening. For one thing, there are a lot of health systems now that are refusing to renew their, their contracts with Medicare Advantage providers, Medicare Advantage uh, Mayo Clinic. Um, they are they are not renewing any, as far as I know, any um, Medicare Advantage contracts. Um, if you have Medicare Advantage, you're not going to get care at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, that's that's huge, and and that's just one of uh, many many health systems around the country. Um, a, a lot of those health systems, I, I don't know, a lot of those health systems are um, not completely refusing all Medicare Advantage programs, but the egregious ones, you know, they just look at the denial rates and, and the delayed payment rates, and uh, certainly the outliers, they're not gonna do business with them anymore. So what that means is, is that uh, hopefully, this steady climb in the percentage of people on Medicare Advantage is going to uh, to level off and actually start to reverse. Um, so that that's uh, that's our main focus. We had a uh, we had a uh, a demonstration at uh, United Healthcare and uh, and uh, Aetna a couple of months ago. Um, we had about I think about sixty people. Who, who showed up and we started our demonstration in front of the Aetna headquarters. Um, they knew we were coming because I, I went, I got there about an hour early and there was already a police car. I don't know if you know the Aetna headquarters building, but it, it's a, it's a big complex. It's like, it's almost like a college campus. And there's this big building that's set back with landscaping and from the public sidewalk, there's a little bit of a plaza and some steps that go down a long sidewalk to the building. And that plaza is private property. So there was already a police car there. And then over the next hour, uh, there ended up being five police cars there. Um, and they were absolutely, don't step across this line. Um, so I think that says something about 
their their uh, fear of of uh, of publicity. Um, and then we went uh, we we marched downtown to the United Healthcare Building, which of course is a a business skyscraper um, right downtown, um, and uh, went into their offices to to a lobby that gives access to the offices and they kicked us out of there. Um, but so, so a combination of, of some actions like that, that get some publicity, um, but mainly what we're doing right now. Um, I, I have a plan um, that I'm pitching to the national PNHP. Um, this period that just passed the, the open enrollment period, um, I think is really critical in that fight against Medicare Advantage. And I would really like to see a national campaign by all of our organizations working with unions, working with all sorts of uh, entities um, to, to educate people about Medicare Advantage. There's, there's plenty of, as we just saw, there's, there's plenty of stuff online on YouTube and TikTok about that. But I think... If, if we have a concerted effort starting sometime in late September uh, for that two or three weeks leading up to the beginning of open enrollment, which is always October 15th, um, where we can educate people, um, uh, I think that can that can have an impact. Um, uh, another thing is, so, so the, uh, Chris, who, who you just saw in this video, uh, he's one of a small number of brokers um, who sign people up. You know, when you when you are signing up the first time or if you want to switch, you might go to a broker because it's a little complicated. Um, and and when you sign when, when one of these brokers uh, enrolls somebody in Medicare Advantage, they get around seventeen hundred dollars for doing that. And when they sign somebody up for straight Medicare, they get about six hundred dollars uh, at best. And so obviously they're trying to sign people. They won't even tell people about gap insurance, for example, um, because they just want everybody to be Medicare Advantage. There's a small number of people like like Chris um, who will actively discourage people from enrolling in Medicare Advantage even though that means a cut in how much money they're making. Um, and and uh, I wanna work with them as well in this, what I would like to see as a, as a national, if not national, at least state, um, free open enrollment education and publicity campaign. Um, so that's my two bits worth. One, one, one other ancillary thing, that that no that we didn't touch on, um, and and that's the um, uh, well well two things. One is the absolute incursion of private equity into healthcare. Um, it is ruining healthcare. It's making it more expensive, et cetera. Um, but the other is um, these these drug these pharmacy deals. Um, where a pharmacy company buys medications at wholesale and then they sell them to um, or, or, or they and they distribute them and the health insurance company uh, reimburses. Um, but then they make them give them a lot of money back. So, so there's there's one there, there's an article in uh, JAMA. Uh, that was just published. It, it, it came out on the 5th of December, um, showing that um, in this one cancer drug, it costs the company that makes the drug $4.60 a pill to manufacture. And they're selling it for $126 a pill. That's a 3,000% markup. Um, and, and, uh, uh, the what all this adds up to is there's just so much corruption throughout our society, and healthcare is a ripe area. That's why it's gone from six percent to what seventeen percent, eighteen percent now. Um, and and the the real fight is is the fight against corruption. But for right now, I think it's 
very important to beat back Medicare Advantage um, and to do that in a, and, and I think the time to do that is that free and that open enrollment period and, and just really blitz uh, the airways during the, the beginning of, of uh, open enrollment. I have one more question for you. Does PMHP Connecticut have a meeting scheduled uh, in the future, like after the first of the year? And uh, whether you do or not, could you put in the chat how people could get in touch with you? Oh, sure. Um, it's real easy. philbrewermd at, at gmail.com. Okay, that's philbrewermd at gmail.com. Um, yeah, we, we do meet regularly. Our chapter was um, uh, was not very active until the past year. We've 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 really ramped it up. Um, our our big problem right now there's a there's a medical student or a student uh, branch of PNHP called SNAP, um, and so Yale, UConn, Quinnipiac, they all have chapters. Um, but we've had a hard time getting them to to do much right now, but we're working on that because um, we, we've got to get them involved. Nationally, they're very involved um, in, in most of the country, but yeah. And if anyone wants to contact Medicare for All Connecticut, I'll put it in the chat, uh, info at uh, Medic yeah, Medicare or no, not three. Well, <laughs> CT dot org. And uh, we'll be back next month. Uh, second Tuesday comes out on January 9th. So everyone just enjoy winter solstice and just this time of the year. And uh, we'll see you then. Go Pagan here. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for having me.